So what the hell is going on with Terence Crawford and Errol Spence? Personally, I have just about lost interest in the fight. Uh, I'm kind of over it, basically. You know, if they can't get it done, then... Oh, well. But give the video a like. Comment, sub. Do you know anything? I haven't been following any other gossip channels that probably still talk about this in so far as I can tell right now. Dead fight. So uh, maybe you could let me know in the comments what the latest rumors are. Anyway, I thought Bob Aaron was the problem. Now that Bob is not in the picture, why hasn't the fight been made? This idea that a boxing promoter who has complained about how little, if any, money he has made on a certain fighter has a chance to put him in a unification fight with all the belts on the line. Undisputed. The biggest fight of Terrence Crawford's career, right? He's somehow going to say, no, I don't want that money. Let me take a sip of my coffee. How dumb do you have to be to think that? Now, Bob Arum might have prevented the fight from happening in certain in spots or at certain points when maybe he thought the deal wasn't good enough or it wasn't just or there were no appropriate venues available for the dates presented blah 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 who knows right this is a lot more complex than some of these channels out there would have you believe but this idea that Bob Arum prevented this fight because what he didn't want to get paid finally when it came to Crawford no Tim Smith from the PBC told you what like six or seven years ago now that that fight is impossible to make because both guys want too much money and at that time right which was a long time ago he stated that they want in the neighborhood of 10 million dollars each and that money just isn't there he said right so, uh, as a promoter, let's say Bob Aaron were to promote the fight, if these guys are both asking for $10 million at that point in time, and the fight isn't worth that much, what promoter is going to promote it, right? This is why you see Bob Aaron sometimes, most notably, most recently, probably with Teofimo Lopez and Jamel Herring. Uh, you see Bob Aaron releasing guys to, you know, go out on their own or... Uh, you know, what normally might be top rank fights, they go to purse bid and, you know, some outside promoter wins the purse bid and puts stages the fight on and loses loses their ass on the fight. Shout out to Triller and Teofimo Lopez. You know what I mean? So <laughs> Bob is a slick old coon. He knows what he's doing, right? So this idea that he doesn't want to make money is ridiculous. But here's the interesting thing, and there are will be many in this video. Terence Crawford um, has a mandatory due in like three weeks or something like that. Less than that, right? Every nine months, if you hold the WBO title, you have to defend against the Mando. And we have Virgil Ortiz first in line. Then we have... Um, Jaron Ennis, and then we have Keith Thurman. All good fights, right? So, what's going on, right? How is it that when certain fighters, um, when they're supposed to fight for Undisputed, right? The road to Undisputed for certain fighters is just paved with, I don't know, gold bricks or something. The red carpet gets rolled out and they just get to it, right? Like, think Terrence Crawford <clears throat> at 140 pounds, right? But then when it comes to certain fighters, it's just like 175 pounds, right? Mando, 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 Mando. Both guys have to fight Mandos. Why can't they fight each other, right? And I'm not saying this always holds true, but generally it's, well, who, 
who is it that gets the easier road to undisputed, right? Black fighters. And is it because they're black? No, it's because they're Western and they fight. They generate the most green generally, right? Because that's the only color that boxing cares about. However, you can't claim that boxing is racist. That that's that's really a ludicrous, ludicrous idea for all the you know black power rangers out there, bitching and moaning and crying how you know because Terence Crawford took Bob Arum to court or filed some frivolous lawsuit that got tossed out and never been refiled, right? Well, that proves it. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, just stop saying dumb shit, you idiots out there. All of you channels talking about this racism in boxing, how the black man is being mistreated. You're retarded. You're you're just a fucking race pimp. We all know this. Anyway. Mm. So, just taking a sip of some substandard coffee this morning. I fucked up. Anyway. Um... Yeah, you know, how long, how much longer will these mandos be held off, right? Because if it's Ortiz, maybe maybe he's not in a rush to get that fight or he'd rather fight for all the belts rather than just one, right? So it might make sense for him to wait a little bit, right? But then you also have Jerron Ennis and Keith Thurman on his heels, right? And that's just insofar as the WBO. And then you got Spence with the other three belts where the Mandos are surely, at least to one of them, there's got to be a Mando knocking on on that door right now, right? But if it's a PBC guy or, or someone affiliated, you know what I mean, with this or that guy, yeah, maybe he could be given some promises or money to just shut up for a second and hold out a little bit longer, you know what I mean? Like, okay, all right. But eventually, these guys are going to get tired of the BS and they're going to call a Mando and one of the sanctioning bodies are going to call a Mando and, you know, it's going to throw a wrench in into the whole scheme. So here's something else interesting that I uh, talked about a little bit in the past. So by the time Terrence Crawford fought... Sean Porter, right? And it took forever to negotiate that fight. It took like two and a half, maybe three years to negotiate that fight, right? What the hell went on at those negotiating or at that negotiating table? Anyway, by the time he had fought Sean Porter, it had been at least, or right about two years, right? At least almost two years, that he had defended against his mandatory, this is Sean uh, Terence Crawford, provided, and I think he was, that Kavaliauskas was the previous mando. I, I think he was. We're going to say he was, right? So then two years pass, and they can't get that Sean Porter mandatory fight going, right? So if the WBO were to enforce the rules, Terence Crawford should have been stripped of the title, right? The same way some of these other fighters that don't generate as much money and, you know, a lot of them, I think, just happen to be white. Uh, the same way they get stripped if they don't fight their mandatories, you know what I mean? <clears throat> anyway. So what I think happened in the Sean Porter fight is that they actually fought. No one told you this except me, right? And I think they hushed it up or, or they created some loophole, made up some BS or whatever, right? But essentially what by the time Porter and Crawford actually finally fought, they fought for Terrence Crawford's former WBO, then vacant belt. The belt was vacant, but they just didn't tell you about it, right? It was never officially vacant, but for all intents and purposes, it essentially was. Why? Well, because we got news that Sean Porter, as the WBO mandatory, which up until that point was unheard of, got 40% of the purse, whereas customarily he's 
supposed to get 20. All of a sudden, his um, the percentage of the purse bid right got doubled. And that rule is implemented when the title goes vacant. Now, because Porter and Crawford were both American fighters and the fight was to take place in America, Porter, had the title been officially vacated, right, would have actually had a claim to 50% of the purse, right? But, you know, it's likely that Porter played that card at the negotiating table with, with the sanctioning body to get more money out of them. And maybe they came to some kind of compromise where Crawford still gets the lion's share or the 60%. Porter gets 40 because it's kind of in the rule book. And they agree not to strip Terrence Crawford of the title, so on and so forth, right? This is just, you know, sanctioning bodies, boxing politics, machinations. But the fact that Porter, who was, as Amanda, was supposed to get 20, all of a sudden got 40, which was unheard of, leads me to believe that something like that must have happened, right? Because Crawford hadn't fought his Mando for two years. So if I'm Porter and I'm coming to the negotiating table as the mandatory, I'm saying, look, man, why, didn't, why aren't you stripping them? Do you, do you want a lawsuit on your hands? Obviously, you don't say that explicitly, but that is the implied consequence if you don't give Porter what he wants, right? So he probably being an experienced businessman by then, definitely, Porter played his cards right and, you know, not extorted because he deserved it, I suppose. Uh, he probably deserved 50-50, but, you know, got 60-40. Because if he really presses the issue, Crawford might just say, I'm vacating, I'm not fighting you, and nobody gets anything, right? Anyway. So, and then... You know, we had that weird fight where Porter was doing really well, outboxing Terrence Crawford. And then he just kind of quit after a couple of flash knockdowns, right? All the theatrics, waving his hands around, lots of fans screaming fix, right? Kenny Porter saying in the press conference that Something along the lines of, you know, his son having taken a lot of punishment in his career up until that point and that he decided to stop the fight, right, in the training camp. And Sean Porter was already, they had already made up their mind, or Sean has, and communicated to his dad, probably, most likely, that he, which is part of what influenced his decision, maybe, right, that he was going to retire, right after fighting Terence Crawford. So then we come to, and let me give a shout out to, um, is it Fred? Barbershop Conversations, I think that's his name. Anyway, he did an interview about a month ago with Bob Arum, where Bob Arum revealed that before the Porter fight, Terence Crawford told him or his people emailed him, told him in an email that they had linked up with Daniel Kinahan. Right, going into the Porter fight, uh, and this is confirmed was confirmed actually a long time ago by an Irish journalist who's one of those guys that's been following and reporting on Daniel Kinahan, named John Hand, a noted crime journalist, right, who has been reporting on Kinahan for years. Shout out to all the crucified or bought and paid for UK channels who never mention Kinahan or only fleetingly and pretend like there's nothing to see here. John Hand got balls. You guys are either bought and paid for or a bunch of pussies or just dishonest pieces of shit. That is what it is, right? Anyway, let me take another sip of this underwhelming coffee. So, yeah, my question is, right, to all the people who say that all boxing fights are real, even though they don't have a shred of evidence, at the very least when you ask them to provide it, they can't. So they must not have a shred of evidence that these fights are real. And yet, right, these conspiracy theorists say that boxing got 
and all these managers, gangsters, and, and all these people. This is what the implication is. This is how fucking dumb you guys are or dishonest or whatever, right? What you're saying, implying, is that all these shady characters, right, with criminal histories and the boxing promoters that you know are corrupt and, and the whole boxing world, right, conspires behind closed doors to give us real fights all the time. This is how retarded your conspiracy theory is. You're absolutely retarded. And just to make it nefarious and a conspiracy, right? They do it so to, I don't know, make money on gambling or something. Or just make money, make lots of money. They give us real fights to make the biggest amount of money possible. Anyway, that's a that's got to be the most retarded conspiracy theory I've ever heard. <laughs> Retards. Anyway, so my question is, what the fuck is Daniel Kinahan doing brokering fights? Managing fighters. Why do we need a gangster to get some of these, allegedly, right? So to get some of these fights over the line, right? The Kinahan cartel is involved in, well, intimidation, according to witness testimony, right? Uh, murder. Um, brokering deals, trading illicit goods all over the world, right? Selling drugs. That's that's the man's experience, right? In the business world. Shady, shady underworld world. First of all, how is boxing even allowing this guy to operate in boxing? Now, I'm not saying he necessarily needs any licenses because, you know, you, you could move about. You could navigate through the boxing world without having any licenses. You know what I mean? I mean, look at most of the journalists, for example, right? But I'm just saying, how is this guy allowed to even be involved? How, how does the boxing world allow this guy to be involved? Well, the same way they allow Jay Prince and a whole bunch of other gangsters to be involved in the sport of boxing, right? To give us real fights, obviously. Fucking, I mean, you got to be straight up retarded, some of you. Sorry, I mean, it's, it's just the truth, right? So why why do we need Daniel Kinahan to broker Fury versus AJ? Why do we need him? Why? A lot of people put a lot of hope in him to be able to get the fight over the line. Why? Was he going to give the guys some extra money? You know what I mean? Whether it was under the table or not, he was going to, you know, sponsor the fight to, to, to coax these guys to, to take it, give them more loot. And if he's giving them money no one gives anybody rarely does anyone give anybody money with no strings attached so what were the strings attached if he were to be involved right and seeing as he got involved with terence crawford before the sean porter fight and then you got sean and it took forever to get that fight over the line and then porter gets all this money he doesn't really deserve it's it's the whole buildup is shady. I mean, they're negotiating this shit back and forth for, I swear to God, like three years, right? Finally, we get the fight, and it looks like a good, it is a good fight, blah, blah, blah. And then we get this very, very disappointing, shady dud of an ending with Kenny Porter saying some weird shit, like not wanting to see his son get hurt. What, like he was going to have some kind of permanent damage from Crawford hitting him to the chest and knocking him down? That was going to that was gonna somehow push him over the line and, and give him brain damage that he hadn't gotten in all those other fights that he say, where he's taking so many punches? That all of a sudden was, that was it, right? Why was he afraid for his son's health? What does that mean, Daniel Kinahan? And then you look at Khan, who has had some really nice things to say about Daniel, what kind of a great man he is, this and that, right? Quitting in the Terrence Crawford fight because he got hit in the thigh. Where he was having a modicum of success apart from getting knocked down, the fight was very competitive. And then he just quits and starts praising da Daniel Kinahan. Moves to the Middle East because he's Muslim, not because he's laundering money or anything. It's just just because he's Muslim, right? 
Why not move to Pakistan? Anyway. Or receiving, you know, certain payments in certain coin um, where he can only, you know, to to uh, to skirt certain regulations and taxes and, and uh, questions, right? And maybe he has to be in a certain place to receive that currency, you know what I mean? Under the table, because it's kind of hard to smuggle suitcases of whatever money they use over there. You know what I mean? I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So, yeah. G good question, right? Why is Daniel Kinahan invo involved in brokering fights? And what does that mean exactly, right? Why does boxing need Daniel Kinahan's involvement? What experience does he have in making deals, right? What kind of deals does he have experience making? And how are these deals administered or um, controlled, made sure that, you know, nobody does anything funny, right? How, you know, what, what, is his, what is his experience when it comes to making deals? And how does he make these deals? And if he's, you know, because apparently he's a rich man, right? And if he's putting some of his own money on the line, which you'd have to imagine that's some of the reason why he's there, right? What are the strings attached when a gangster is involved in funding fights or fighters and brokering fights or fighters, right? Is, is it that crazy, right, to posit that a fight that looks fishy and there's all these fishy things going on in the fight, before the fight happens, right? After the fight. And then there's a gangster involved. Is it really that, does it require that huge leap of faith to say the fight was fucking rigged? Or do you have to just be a dishonest piece of shit to pretend like the shit was real? You know what I mean? <laughs> Am I saying something that's unreasonable here? So all of you, you know, honest and honorable defenders of the virtuous sport of boxing, please explain to me what Daniel Kinahan's involvement is in brokering these fights exactly and why bo does boxing need a gangster, a drug dealer, to uh, make fights? Explain that to me. I would love to hear that. And now that he's not in the picture, right? So how, how likely is the Crawford Spence fight to come off. Because look, let, let's just put, you know, Bud's shoes on for a second and and give him all the benefit of the doubt, right? Let's just say Terrence Crawford is an upstanding gentleman. He has uh, never assaulted anyone because they didn't, you know, polish their their car or wax their car exactly as they were supposed to you know what i mean let's just say he's not beating up on celebrities uh instead of taking on mandos maybe maybe the wbo sanctioned that as as, as a mandatory difference i'm not sure but at the very least beating up on celebrities he's not beating up on celebrities to uh to stay relevant you know what i mean he's just a great upstanding citizen and has no clue as to who Daniel Kinahan really is, what he's involved in, whatever. But at some point in time, when it's, uh, you know, basically time to strike out on his own, right? Come out from under Bob Arum's protection program, right? In-house fights. Shout out to the LDBC. You guys know how this shit works, right? You created the PB. You basically asked for and received the PBC, right? The Negro Leagues. Let's just keep it real. Um, you know, now that it's time, just as it was time for Tyson to leave the protection of his, you know, home, homegrown boxing scene, right? The UK, um, he probably needed Kinahan, right? Uh, Terence Crawford is taking on Sean Porter, right? Finally, apart from Kavalyauskas, right? Finally taking a, a, a real chance in his career, right? Fighting a guy he's supposed to fight, 
not just cherry picking all these fights. I don't care how many titles these guys had or whatever. It was all cherry picks basically when it came to Terence Crawford, draining opponents, right? Whatever. Now that he has to more or less cross the street, right, or fight guys from across the street, and he doesn't want to get fucked, right? He thinks to himself, well, I need some kind of protection, right? And a lot of people say a lot of good things about Kinahan. And when Kinahan is involved, at the very least, nobody fucks around, right? Maybe. I don't know. So if I am to go over to the PBC, right? And he's been talking about, you know, potentially getting robbed, this and that, right? Maybe he felt like he needed back so that none of the judges fuck around, right? Because just the fact that this dude is involved might be enough to have these judges not receive, you know, any... Uh, cash under the table you know what i mean maybe that that's like the bare minimum right probably a lot more to it than that but you know just just look at the port fight if if you have any doubt as to what the fuck happened there anyway so yeah if if terence is to take a chance and cross over to the pbc uh, being you know the b-side obviously not selling very as well on pay-per-view as uh, Errol Spence, obviously not having as many fans as Errol Spence, obviously not having fought the level of opposition that Errol Spence has fought at welterweight, obviously, right? And this being obviously for Undisputed, only bringing a quarter of the pie to the dance party with obviously Spence bringing three quarters. Clearly, he's the B-side. And if he is, then in some way, shape, or form, it's onto him. Up, it's it's incumbent upon him to cross the street, right? Which maybe in order to do that, he had to leave Bob Arum, right? So that Bob Arum, that piece of the pie would go to Terrence as maybe promoting himself in some capacity and not paying Bob Arum whatever Bob Arum takes off the top, right? But at the same time, Leaving Barbero, you know, he's not going to get that protection. Maybe he needed, you know, some back going into the Spence fight. And now that his back is being investigated and seemingly on the run, how likely is this fight to happen? I wonder. I wonder. But if it does, there's that much more of a chance that it will actually be a real fight. I'm not saying it will. I'm not saying it won't. But if this guy on the right isn't involved, then, you know, I am going to get my hopes up. You know what I mean? Anyway. So, not to say that Bob Arum didn't have some of his own ideas on how the fight should happen and... Obviously, he was also going to take his cut off the top. So it's, it's yes, it is another factor that will complicate uh, this fight from, from happening, that will complicate making this fight and maybe prevent this fight from happening. But the only reason why that would ever get in the way of making this fight happening is because the fighters themselves are extremely greedy and they want as much as possible for themselves with as few entities skimming off the top involved as possible right so Terence Crawford leaving Bob Arum that yeah that gave us uh, 10% or whatever Bob takes off the top higher chance let's say of the fight happening but Bud felt like probably like he needed some kind of back and now that neither Bob Arum nor Kinahan are it would seem anyway on Terence Crawford's side, you could probably understand why the fight hasn't happened. The hype has more or less died down and Terence Crawford is seemingly frustrated beating up on celebrities at clubs instead of fighting his mandatory. Or am I making too much sense? I don't know. You let me know. Thanks for watching.